Assalamu alaikum students. I'm your science teacher um, for your Zoom class. And today we are going to have our last lesson for the chapter number seven, sound and hearing. Okay. So before we will move to the next and the last topic, let's have a recap that actually what we have learned so far in this chapter. We had learned how sounds are made how sounds travel means we had learned that they are um, the sound waves are longitudinal waves then we learned about the bell jar experiment which shows that sound cannot travel in vacuum sound as a wave we learned about the uh, model of a longitudinal wave that it is basically a regular movement of compressions and rear fractions then we learned about the speed of the sound, which is generally 330 meter per second. But then we have learned that how the speed of sound differ for different materials that all depends upon the temperature. And then we have learned about eco, eco location somehow. And um, basically it is the reflection of sound waves. We learned about pitch, frequency, hertz, amplitude, oscilloscope, etc this was our uh, last um, topic and then we have learned about the wave equation we have learned about the wave equation okay so today actually we are going to start our last topic and that is basically this yes students the last topic is that how do we hear sound Okay, we have learned about that how the sound waves are produced, how do they travel, but today we have to learn that how do we hear the sound. And I hope that every one of you must be clear of it, that for this Allah has given us two ears for hearing the sound. So our ears are energy changers. They change the energy. You will learn uh, after it that how the energy and which energy is changed their job means the job of the ear is to change sound energy into electrical signals basically which are sent to the brain okay and our brain interprets these changes and then actually we hear any sound vibrations from a vibrating object it can be any musical instrument or any a human voice, any other voice is there that enters the ear and make the air inside vibrate. And this vibration ultimately and lastly reaches to our brain and over here then it is being interpreted or being sensed and then our brain sent us a message to hear the sound. So all of you can see the structure of human ear right now over here so basically human ear has three parts okay the outer ear that is that includes your this ear flap and in biology we call it as pinna and then it is an inward tube or canal that is called as auditory canal okay and you can see over here there are some here these are necessary uh, for our ear because they help to trap the dust or the wax uh, 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 dust particles to enter in our ear and ultimately they are collected over here as wax and i hope every one of you know well known about this wax then is the middle ear in which this is the most important part over here which is called as the tympanic membrane okay what it is tympanic membrane and in common we call it as eardrum what we call it eardrum and i hope every one of you know what is this eardrum this is the most sensitive part in our ear then are the three connected bones in the structure of the ear that is hammer anvil and stirrup what are they hammer anvil and stirrup and students adding up to your knowledge the 
uh, human ear bones are the smallest bones in our body. So inshallah, in the later uh, clip, you will see that how smaller they are and they are interconnected with each other. And this, these three uh, bones are connected with this oval window. I hope every one of you can see it is connected with this oval window, which is connecting this middle ear to the inner ear. Okay. Then is the three semi-circular canals. I hope every one of you know what is a circle. And half of a circle is always called as a semi-circular canal. So students, you can easily see these semi-circular canals over here. Okay. And by the end, these three semi-circular canals are connected with this coiled structure, which is called as cochlea. What it is called? Cochlea. And this is the actual organ or actual part of hearing. Why? Because it has hair in it and it also has and it also has certain um, uh, cells which sense that vibrations which are being traveled up to it and they send the message through this auditory nerve. You can see over here auditory nerve to the brain. Brain interprets it and then we are able to hear it so students our human ear is composed of three parts outer ear which includes the pinna and the auditory canal middle ear which has this tympanic membrane or the ear drum three smallest bones hammer anvil and stirrup and these are connected with the inner ear with this oval window and an inner ear we have the, these three semicircular canals and they are also connected with this coil structure which is called as cochlea. And when the sensation or vibrations reach there, they send this message to, through the auditory nerve to our brain and our brain sends that sound and we are able to hear the sound. Last but not the least is this one special tube over here, which is called as Ostation tube, students. This Ostation tube actually connects your human ear with the throat. I hope you know that ear, nose, and throat are interconnected organs. Okay, that's why we call them ENT. Okay, so for increasing your knowledge, I'm sharing a video with you all so that you will understand that how sound travels. Let's have a look on this video. How are you listening to this music right now? Well, you might know know that your speakers are creating sound and your ears are listening to it but there's a lot more going on over here you see all your speakers are doing right now is vibrating the particles of the air close to it then they vibrate How are you listening to this music right now? Well, you might know that your speakers are creating sound and your ears are listening to it. But there's a lot more going on over here. You see, all your speakers are doing right now is vibrating the particles of the air close to it. Then they vibrate the air molecules close to them and so on and so forth. And we call this a sound wave. And eventually when the air molecules close to your ears start vibrating, we hear sound. 
but how does something as boring as air molecules going back and forth make us experience something like this well for that we need to look at our ear carefully I mean the entire structure of the ear So let's look at how the different parts of the ear work together to make us experience sound. So our ear can be divided into three parts. The outer ear, the middle ear, and the inner ear. The outer ear starts with the pinna. It's the part that you can see and touch, or in my case, the part that my mom would twist quite often. Its job is to collect as much sound waves as possible and channel it into the auditory canal. The sound waves pass through the auditory canal and eventually meet the eardrum, which is shown in green over here. The eardrum is a transparent membrane which is super sensitive to the vibrations of the air. So as the air vibrates, even the eardrum starts vibrating, just like the skin of a drum. And as you can see, the eardrum also separates the outer ear from the middle ear. This brings us to the middle ear. The middle ear consists of the three tiniest bones of the human body. And they're together called the ossicles. And they have pretty cool names. They're called the malleus, the incus, and stapes. And here's the actual picture of these three bones. And because of their shapes, they're also commonly called as the hammer, the anvil, and the stirrup. Stirrup is where you rest your feet when you're riding your horse. All right, so as the eardrum vibrates, you can see the ossicles also start vibrating, transferring the vibrations from the eardrums to the inner ear. Now their main job is to increase or amplify the pressure of the sound waves when it reaches the inner ear. But why do we need to increase the pressure of the sound waves? Because as we will see, the inner ear consists of a liquid, not air. So the vibrations must transfer into a liquid. And you might already know that vibrating or moving particles of liquid is much harder than moving particles of air. Which is why it's very easy for you to swing your arms in the air, but it's pretty difficult to do that inside water, like say in a swimming pool. And so to set this liquid in vibration, the pressure has to be high enough. And in fact, it turns out that our ossicles increase the pressure of the sound about 20 times. But how do they do that? Well, just take a look at the base of the stapes. It has such a small area compared to that of the eardrum. So when the force gets transmitted from the eardrum to the stapes, it gets concentrated in a very tiny area. And you might know when you concentrate force in a very tiny area, you increase its pressure. And that brings us to the inner ear. The inner ear consists of a bony structure which is shown in purple. Now as you can see, the top part of this structure consists of three semicircular rings. They help us in maintaining our balance when walking or dancing or whatever we do. So they're not involved in hearing, so not so important for us. The part that's involved in hearing is this snail-like structure. This is called the cochlea. What does it do? Well, although these bones have already started dancing to the music, nothing gets heard until these vibrations are converted to electricity and sent to our brain. And that's exactly what the cochlea does. Now the cochlea is super complex and it's also a little mysterious. Even today there are certain things about it we just don't know. And so we'll definitely not go into the details. But as mentioned earlier, it contains a liquid. 
and when the stirrup hits our cochlea, this liquid starts vibrating. And then there are some specialized cells in the cochlea that convert these vibrations into electrical signals. And these electrical signals go through the auditory nerves all the way to your brain where it gets finally interpreted as sound. And the cells of your cochlea are amazing. The electrical impulses that they generate are super sensitive to how loud the sound is or how feeble the sound is. Whether it is high frequency or low frequency. And as a result, your brain can differentiate the tiniest differences in the sound. And so you can understand different letters or words or even understand what I'm saying right now. Or hear the different notes of this music. And so to summarize, the outer ear collects the sound waves through the pinna and directs them to the eardrums. The three optical bones of the middle ear amplify these sound waves, transferring it into the cochlea. And the cochlea converts the back and forth vibrations of the particles into electrical signals and sends it to our brain. And regardless of how many words I use to describe what's going on, the very fact that the back and forth movement of the air can be converted into this amazing experience we call sound is truly unfathomable and beyond words. So students, uh, I hope all of you have well understand about today's video and um, you have learned that how basically sound uh, is reached to our ear and how do we hear the sound. So let's move to our next topic now, noise pollution. I hope this is not a new topic for you, but still we will see what it is that too much noise causes noise pollution. Traffic noise can be a nuisance to people who live close to the main road. Machinery noise can, be a no can cause noise pollution. The radios or any other media like TV, sound systems, even in schools, when the, stu when the students, they talk haphazardly in the classroom, hospitals, airports, etc., all are the causes of noise pollution. So noise is basically the irregular sound waves. We had learned a lot about the types of sound waves in our last lesson, that in loud sound, what type of wave is made, in quiet sound, what type of wave is produced? In low sound, what type of sound is produced? So noise is basically the irregular sound waves are termed as noise. So when they reach to our ear in the form of irregular sound waves, definitely it uh, hurts unpleasant to our ear, okay? So how we will measure the sound? For this, we have a special instrument i hope every one of you can see over here and that instrument is called as sound meter what it is called sound meter and it is a digital sound meter as you can see that let's say it has uh, taken the record of any of uh, sound and it is giving you 57.5 db so next to it we need to go for what this db stands for as you can see over here students this is the unit of measuring sound in the last lesson we learned about the unit of a frequency that was hertz i hope you can recall but the unit of sound is decibel decibel and we write it in the form of small d capital b okay so over here you can see that different objects have different sound waves or the decibels like when there is any fireworks it gives us 140 decibel sound a jet engine when it takes um, uh, when it uh, takes off in the air it takes 130 decibel siren 120 trombone 110 helicopter 100 hair dryer 
90 truck 80 car 70 conversation 60 refrigerator 50 rain 40 rustles of leaf leaves 30 whisper 20 and breathing 10 decibels so this this is a basically a decibel uh, scale means decibel chart to tell you that different materials different things have different sound um uh, like they have different strength of sound and they are always measured in decibels okay students okay so let's move to the next now our last topic is sound proving okay what it is this sound proving how it is beneficial for us when we walk into an empty room you usually hear echoes the walls floor and ceiling okay i hope you know what is ceiling means the top part of the room it reflects the smallest sound it may take several seconds for the sound energy to be absorbed so that the sound fades away okay sound travels fastest in solids than air we already learned about it in addition sound travels through hard solids like soft foam weddings fabric layers of newspaper egg boxes means all these examples are best for sound proofing means they travels through it and they hold up them all in them that's why all these materials are used as sound proofing so all these materials stop the transmission of sound across a surface okay now let's have a look on some sound proofing uh, substances like you can see that this styrofoam is being adjusted with this wall and it helps to make this wall as a sound proof similarly you can see that this person is setting this foam foam like fabric in between these structures which help to make this room or this area wherever he is fitting it into it making it sound proof means sound now cannot pass to the next room or the next area okay these type of soundproofing materials is sometimes uh, made in the uh, theaters where the movies are uh, being played or these type of sound proofs are also being fitted in halls auditoriums etc and etc even there are some soundproofing um, special fabrics are pro present in inside the your cars and so many areas so this is about the examples of sound proofing okay so that was our last topic today actually we had learned about that how do we hear sound we had learned about the structure of human ear and even its working how the sound travels inside the ear and being uh, reached to our uh, brain and how the brain interprets the sound then we had learned about the noise pollution okay this is a very easy and common topic that when there is too much noise, it causes noise pollution. What are the examples of noise pollution? And what is noise basically? It is basically the irregular sound uh, waves. Next, we learned about what is the instrument called to measure the sounds that is called as sound meter. There are now mostly the digital sound meters are available in the market. And then we have learned about the unit of sound that is decibel. And it is denoted by small d capital B. And here I have shared the decibel scale or the decibel chart with you all that how different objects have different um, values of sound or the different decibels and then we have learned about the sound proofing means which materials help to trap the sound in in them and then the sound will not travel to the next room or the next area and that are some of the examples of sound proofing okay students i hope every one of you have learned about this topic and the whole chapter